This is a bonus video on the long and complicated story of Persona 1, as a result of completing our light goal. Thank you! If you haven't seen the original video, you should, as I go over the C back route, which is the main story, and I talk about the main game mechanics as well as my overall review of it. Enjoy! Okay, a quick recap. Hidehiko tells his friends of a dark ritual that summons Personas. Masao calls him an idiot and says it's not real. They do the ritual, Hidehiko is wrong, wait, right. We obtain a persona named Simon Konjo, wake up in the infirmary with a perverted nurse, leave to see Maki in the hospital, escape the hospital after it's overrun by demons, and make it to the school after saving Maki's mother at the local shrine. From here, we go to the hole in the wall and to help Kei and Masao at the police station starting the main story. However, there is a rumor going on at the school of a Snow Queen curse. We talk to a student who directs us to Devil Boy, which leads us to the drama club president who tells us that no play existed, the student council who refused to show us the school drama records and what they performed each year, and go to the principal's office where Principal Oishi will say, hey, stop looking into the Snow Queen curse thing. It's a rumor and it's a senseless spot for your teacher, Psycho, as she lost a close friend during the show, which is why we no longer do the play, and we keep the mask in the gym storage room. Wait, the mask is still here? In the storage room, yes. Why did you tell me that? So you won't go to the storage room and get the mask in the orange box with talismans on it. Okay, so don't open that box? Yes, because it has the Snow Queen mask in it. Correct. And it's a sore spot for Saiko because she lost a close friend who played the role last. Absolutely, so don't show her the mask. Got it. When we get to the gym storage room, we see an orange box with talismans on it. I wonder what's in the box. Oh, neat. I wonder if Saiko will like it. When we head up to the gym, we see Masao and Maki going through the hole in the wall, starting the main story, with Yukino and Yuka watching them leave. Saiko opens the door, hearing that Masao has returned. After explaining what has happened, she noticed the mask we recently obtained. That mask? I didn't know it was still here. She then tells us the story of Snow Queen. Once upon a time, there was an evil demon who had a mirror that blurred out the beautiful things in the world and made the ugly things clear. The demon climbed up the heaven with the intent to cause mischief to God, but the mirror broke on the way up, raining down to shatter pieces onto Earth. On Earth, Kay and Gerda were playing together, and Kay was pierced with the shards in his eyes and heart, causing him to grow cold. Kay, an overly kind and nice friend to Gerda, became cold as his heart and bullied her. One cold winter, a white sleigh appeared in front of Kay, being driven by a beautiful woman, and took Kay away on it. That woman was the Snow Queen. She took Kay on her ice castle far up north. When Gerda caught wind of Kay's disappearance, she jumped into action to find him despite his actions towards her. And despite the many obstacles thrown her way, she was able to make it onto the castle with her profound courage and love for him. When she finally found Kay, he was half frozen and forgot about her entirely. Tears began to fall onto Kay, melting his heart and returning him to normal. With the shards gone in Kay's eyes and heart, he returned to normal and remembered who he was, and left with Gerda hand in hand, living happily ever after. But some say the mask is cursed, Saiko says. I I'm sure that's not true. Just mostly students like Devil Boy to spread information, no? <laughs> yeah, it's just a silly rumor. Hi, Warden. I'm okay. <laughs> Saiko wears the mask to show there's no real danger, and we have a little laugh with it. Which, hey, mask isn't that scary at all, huh? Spoke too soon. We wake up at the school covered in ice, waking up with Yukino and Yuka on the floor of the school courtyard. And standing in the middle of it is Saiko. Yukino tries to approach her, but the four pillars of ice rise to the ground. We are no longer speaking to Saiko. She is now the Snow Queen. It's beautiful, she says. The stillness in the pristine condition. It can stay like this forever in my frozen kingdom. Saiko turns to ice, and a realization sets in, as Yukino speaks up. Naoya, you doomed us all! It's all your fault! The Snow Queen has completely encased the school in ice. Students scatter in separate rooms, trying their best to stay warm, when all hopes seem to be lost. A butterfly enters the courtyard. Hello, friend. 
Philmon tells us that to remove the curse, we need to use the demon mirror that he just happens to have lying around. However, some self-assembly is required, as he only has the frame, and we need to get the mirror shards that the Queen has scattered in the three towers, that are also conveniently in the school. Thus, our journey truly begins. From here, we seek out people who want to join us to take down the Queen. Eriko, a skilled fencer, joins us after talking to Devil Boy in the library, and discovers what the towers represent, based on the writings on the door. Since you can read Greek, Erica notes that the tower in the library is also known as the Nemesis Tower, something that even Devil Boy couldn't have figured out, and he's an expert on the strange occult, so she's an easy clue to the party. Okay, asks to join the party, but he can immediately fuck off. If you've seen the last video, you know why. And then with the search for objectively better people. While getting our bearings and getting the team together, a comment still rings in my ear. This is all your fault. And yeah, this is my fault. At any point, I could have easily stopped talking about it and respected Oishi's request to not open the box and get the mask. Sure, it shouldn't have been to school, but still, I went and got it. This is why we have obtained our persona, Saimin Konjo, a demon in Hindu lore and a protector in Buddhist lore, who spread diseases and caused the death of millions, only to look back on his actions and dedicate his life to reverting his previous actions. We have directly caused stress and disaster for no reason. We need to fix this. After we head to the cafeteria, we see Hidehiko trying to talk down Toro. A larger boy, who is described as, quote, his love for food made him physically strong, but emotionally fragile. G Jesus, okay, okay. Hey, listen, I didn't mean to hide all the food from you. It's just what we have. Yeah, I thought you gobble it up, a student proclaims. If you're gonna hide all the food from me, then the food is mine, Toro proclaims. What? Just because this guy goes crazy from rejection now, we all have to starve to death? It is obvious from here that Toro has been bullied for being overweight. In fact, it seems that he's really self-conscious about it, as he would also even censor the term fat and call it the F word. Croaking alongside a fat story. <laughs> ah, you said the F word. <laughs> no. Don't call me fat, that's the F word. <laughs> <laughs> Jokes aside, he has been harassed and bullied since going to school here. This brought up that the person who rejected him was Yuka. Earlier in the year, Toro asked out Yuka, and from his recollection, she was pretty rude about it. The minute that he speaks up into hurry up as she has something better to do. When he finally said he loved her, uh oh, she totally crushed him, asking if he's seen himself in the mirror recently before absolutely dunking on him, calling him the F word slow and insulting him for wearing the same clothes every day despite it being the school uniform and that his manga is a hobby. I don't know what keeps you going. Everything about you sucks. And she leaves him alone in the cafeteria. Yikes. Toro remembers this vividly and Yuka doesn't even remember it at all but believes she probably said it. Oh my god. Toro finally snaps and says that he has the power of a demon, his own persona. And this is the first fight of the game. Toro's stomach explodes, revealing a... I, I don't want to say. I don't know. We do get to see everyone else's personas. Yuka's persona, Hyori, a modest, beautiful virgin that lingers in paradise, according to Islam. They're also described as eternally young and extremely pure, which I don't think describes Yuka at all. Yukino's persona, Vesta, which is a virgin goddess in Roman mythology. Despite being about chastity sexuality, she didn't get married at all and put others over herself, which I think actually describes Yukino. Neriko's persona is Nike, a goddess of victory in war in Greek mythology, and is often portrayed as an angel. She was originally part of Athens, but broke away and became her own individual goddess. Yeah, he goes here too, uh, but we already saw his persona, so meh. After defeating Toro, Hidehiko is caught up to speed and invites himself to join the party. Despite me saying no, he joins without my consent. So, all there's left to do is go to one of the three towers and get the mirror back to its full self. The first tower? Hypnos Tower. As we enter, we're introduced to the only new game mechanic. Time. An indefinite, continuous march forward. One that sets a reminder that we can never go back. Only forward. It also determines how long we can stay in the tower. On the top right of the screen, we're given a limited amount of time, roughly two hours. 
according to some Reddit posts and other forums that I found. If you run out of time, I, I don't know. I never ran out of time, so for all I know, it could just be a placebo to get players to rush through the tower. But since I'm super strong, I didn't run into any issues. We're also introduced to a side character named Mariko Yabi, a student from Yamakumo High, and the president of the Paranormal Watchers Club. Fun fact, she's also the only member of the club. That is not even official. She came to visit Devil Boy, who she calls by his actual name, Tsumo, which I prefer Devil Boy, to be honest. Uh, Mariko came to visit St. Hermillon, and she got caught up in all the mess, but is making the most of it as she's uncovering the tower's secrets. A cute little side character. After that, we enter into a cold room, and on the floor is Tadashi and Takami, two students from the fencing club that are well known for fighting with each other. And Natsumi, that perverted nurse that was hitting on me when I woke up from the infirmary. They all seem to be alive, just asleep, sleeping peacefully on the cold tiles of the floor. Huh. Deeper into the tower, we can find more people asleep. Principal Oishi and Vice Principal Hanya are sleeping next to each other. Weird. Since they're in no real danger, we can keep pushing forward to see what's going on. And we might find our answer in the dream world. Upon entering, it seems we can see people's dreams we walk past. First, we see Natsumi's. She's dreaming about dating an attractive guy and talking about what to buy at the corner store. And Hiko points out that this isn't just a random guy, it's her ex. Looks like she never got over him and is dreaming about buying dinner. Dinner that he thought she was making instead of buying. Uh oh. To save Natsumi from this awkward moment, I pinched her awake and moved on. Next, we see Oishi and Hanya's dream. Looks like they're having a joint dream where Hani is the principal and Oishi is not, making this her nightmare. And she now has to follow Hanya's orders. Hanya's dream is being able to punish students with expulsion if they're late three times ever. Not in a week or in a month, hell, not even in the year. If they're late three times ever during their time in high school, they are expelled. Oishi hates this idea and tries to protest, but Hanya magically creates a new rule, saying that if you ever criticize slash disobey his ruling, you are fired. I've personally seen enough. Let's wake up these guys and get out of this nightmare. Next, we get to Tadashi and Takami's dream, where they are confessing their love for each other. What? Why? I thought you hated each other. You see these posters back there? Tadashi put them there, in the public fencing room, and Takami hated them. Please just pinch them. I'm getting secondhand cringe. Finally, we get to the last room in the dream world. Sat on an isolated throne, we meet the master of the tower, Kumi Heroes. And next to her is her persona, Hypnos, the god of sleep. The younger brother of Thanatos, as well as Nyx, known as a gentle deity that helps humans wherever he can, but the price is owning half of their life as a result of the human's need to sleep. What we know now is Kumi is controlling the inhabitants by putting them to sleep forever. You're forced to live here in the real world, Kumi proclaims. Isn't it clear that people are the happiest living inside their dreams? They can never be happy like this in the real world. I'm just helping them see that. With the help of Hypnos, Kumi shows us her past along with the struggles she had. Cast as the role of Snow Queen, and on top of her class academically, she was constantly stressed out by excelling in both aspects of her life. To the point it was overwhelming from the club president and other members pressing her for missing rehearsals to study despite her efforts she scored the third highest out of everyone in her grade her father is also relentless not understanding how important the play is to her and how she plays an important role in it as a result of both groups being hard on her she resorted to sleeping and dreaming of a world where she can do both without the harassment of others and thus the tower is born and yeah, so the party just seemed to dismiss Kumi's situation and just chalked her up to being spoiled since it seems she did both anyway. Kind of missing the point there, huh? Kumi says if we want to beat the tower, we have to go to the highest point in the real world. When we get there, she's laying in her bed, ready for our fight. You can't grasp or accept the paradise of dreams I have offered. Tipnos appears into the room, starting the first boss fight. After destroying Hypnos because of... <clears throat> um, <laughs> how long I grinded out the game. Uh, Hypnos is easily destroyed. Just like that, huh? The dream is over. There is no place for me anywhere. But there is a place for you. In the real world. Sure, not everyone's going to have the same dream as you, which is why dreams are so personal. 
they are unique to our own wants. We learned that through Oishi and Hanya. One person's dream is another person's nightmare. But what we also learned is that without action, that's all they'll ever be, dreams. And if you don't take the time to get up and make an effort for yourself, then they'll never truly live your dream. After preparing ourselves by purchasing items at a local shop and placing our newfound mirror shards, the next stop is Thanatos Tower. The room we enter in is covered in skulls and two candles in between a door. A cheerful student appears, welcoming us to Thanatos Tower. Thanks. Love the atmosphere, I, I guess. She later announced herself as the host of the tower, Yuriko Yamamoto. As the host, she tells us the game that we're going to be playing. Pick one of the candles to blow out, and then enter the door. Simple, right? After that, she disappears, leaving us to pick one. So what I'm thinking is that the right candle is the right one to pick, because I am... Uh... Just, you know, the right candle is the uh, right one to pick. So, <laughs> what's happening? So Something's been yanked out of me. Uh, raw candle. Oops. It looks like Yuriko forgot to tell us what happens after blowing out a candle. Gotcha, she claims. You think that's all you had to do here? If you want anything in this tower, you have to give something in return. And the price for this door was your persona. Yuriko disappears again, laughing as we tend to Yukino. She lost Vesta inside the tower. Thanatos is the god of death, immortality in Greek mythology. The main mechanic of this tower is if a party member dies, they will lose their persona, and are able to get it back if they go into Tartarus, which is on the second floor. When we go to get Yukino's persona, we can see Yukino herself on the other side, emphasizing that one's persona is themselves. We also see Mariko here. Hey, welcome to hell. Hope you find something cool to talk about in the deep abyss that's beyond human comprehension. After Yukino talks to herself, she has obtained her persona again, and we can continue through the tower. But before leaving, there's also a chest that holds a shard of the mirror. Well, had a shard, as Mariko got it and will only give us to us for a fee, so thanks, I, I guess. While we climb the tower, it might be a good time to talk about a character I missed, Riji Kido. Described as a, quote, quiet loner who transferred to St. Hermine High School six months ago. Apparently, he's only part of the Seabeck route, so whoops. Uh, but if he was part of the party, it would have been revealed that he was related to Kendori and his son and wanted to join the party to confront him. After the Seabeck incident, his persona awakens. Bress, a former king part of the Fomorian kin, which are a race of demonic giants in Irish mythology. And as a result, seeked guidance from the giants for his rulings. Bress worked his people like slaves, and as a result of his cruel leadership, he was exiled after being overthrown by Nuada, the king Bress replaced. A shame I didn't have him in my party originally, but it seems like a laundry list of things to do, according to this GameStop forum, which has you to <clears throat> speak to a teacher close to school entrance and ask her to enter the room where we did the persona ritual, see Riji where he walks out of the room, go to room 2-1 and talk to a student who just bitches about how abandoned buildings should be torn down, Go to a casino in the mall so Masao will talk to a friend where he'll also talk about the abandoned factory. Go to said factory where Riji is loitering around and threatens to cut you, wanting to keep my life, leave, and go to the Yin and Yan shop in the mall and speak to his mom. Go to the Seabeck blockade where Riji gets upset and tries to fight a guard that Masao will try to protect him. And then finally, continue on the Seabeck route as normal where you will go to the alternate school, you will bump into Riji where he will join your party. Simple, really. On the sixth floor, we are greeted by two chests in a door. Another trap is set by Yuriko for sure. On cue, Yuriko appears and tells us what we already know. Pick one, and if you pick the wrong one, you lose your persona. Easy. Right is the right way to go. Uh, did I say right and meant left? When we get to the top floor, we are finally confront Yuriko. The room is covered with floating skulls on a floating floor. Yuriko appears in front of Yukino. You really have a nice face. Why not die here and keep your looks forever? If you keep on living, you'll get older and your looks will deteriorate. 
come on. It'll be fun, Yuriko exclaims. We can live in this tower together, looking gorgeous. She doesn't really want to fight us. Rather for us to join her, since she's the only one that lives here. Hideko brings Yuriko back to reality. Yuriko, you're dead. The mask killed you, and now you're a guardian of this tower. We shouldn't be throwing our lives away for a false world. Yuriko tries to get Yuko on board. Come on, you're the cutest one here. Why don't you join me and keep your beauty that you love so much? And here, Yuka says something I didn't expect her to say. Don't you think for a second that we are the same? You really, and I mean really, piss me off. You are a loser who threw away all her responsibilities. I would never die just to stay pretty. Holy shit, you actually cooked her. And now the second boss fight begins. Yuriko's persona is Thanatos, the god of death in Greek mythology. Unlike the other gods that brought death, Thanatos was peaceful and brought people to eternal sleep like his brother, Hypnos, who we fought earlier. This is why Yuriko doesn't outright want to be confrontational with us, rather persuade us to die as his path of least resistance. Even during the fight, he doesn't attack us directly and uses his tentacles to do most of the front work while Thanatos uses ranged attacks. A tough battle for sure, but thanks to our well-earned grinding, we beat him without a sweat. After defeating Yuriko, there's silence in the room. Uh, I don't like the Snow Queen. I, I really don't. I'm glad it ended like this, Yuriko mutters. What? I got to talk to you guys. It was a nice battle. It was a good thing I lost. I'm human, and humans die. To tell you the truth, I was scared. I used to hang out with friends, and we would go and have fun. Every day was fun. And I was happy. I thought it couldn't get any better than this. But then I realized that if it doesn't get any better than this, that means it'll come crashing down on me. Does that mean I'll never be happy again? I couldn't shake the thought. When I wore the Snow Queen mask, it spoke to me. It promised that I can live forever, and before I knew it, I was in this tower and been here ever since. All my friends and family are gone. I was so selfish. And when you guys showed up, I was really happy. I won't be lonely anymore. Your power came from unfathomable sadness, Yuriko comments. And she's right. Because of her wish to be living in the good times, she decided to live alone in isolation and feared that the good times ending. That's what makes the good times, well, good. Because eventually, they'll come to an end, and that's okay. Just because the fun ended doesn't mean they'll be gone forever. You'll have ups and downs in life. And while it may seem that the down times are forever, eventually the good times will come back. You just have to wait. With only one tower to go, we entered the Nemesis Tower. The tower starts like the last one, with the guardian of the tower welcoming us to it and identifying themselves as Vichiko Matsudaria, whose immediate ego is visible to see makes an offer to spare us if Hidehiko agrees to be her pet, which he surprises and declines, and welcomes us deeper into the dungeon. Nemesis Tower is named after, surprising no one, Nemesis, known for their divine retribution against pride and arrogance, which is ironic given how Michiko greeted us with her nose to the sky. Mariko adds a whopping nothing to the tower. She predicts that the aliens are behind the freezing phenomenon, which, no, and asks us if we've been abducted by aliens recently. What, what a weirdo. On the third floor, we meet a devil torturing two students. On the right, we see Toro being waterboarded with milk. Milk boarded? And on the left, we see Devil Boy doing push ups underneath spikes. Jesus, what a hardcore workout this is. The devil, aptly named Mr. Devilish, is torturing them because of their sins. Toro being gluttonous and Devil Boy being lazy? Fuck, he's also lactose intolerant. That's actually so mean. But why is she doing this? Michiko appears to the next door. It's because they are hideous. Their ugliness is unforgivable. Therefore, I, the Akuma of attractiveness, am punishing these sinners. Hideko demands that they are immediately freed from their chains. Oh, you care about your friends, hmm? Michiko replies, friendship? Ha! <laughs> well, in honor of your friendship, I'll tell you where the key is to free them. Oh, that's actually rather nice of you. Just exit the door on the left and follow the path, and you'll reach there in no time, Misuko exclaims, and disappears laughing as she always does. Well, we need to find these shards, and if we're able to save everyone from the school, I I'm sure Toro and DB... Can I call Devil Boy DB, right? Are we cool enough for that? 
Anyway, I'm sure they'll understand we have to find these shards and to save everyone from this horrific disaster. Huh? Huh? Michiko, why, why are you here? Why are you here so soon? You should be saving your friends. D d did I go the wrong way? Well, I guess if I beat you, my friends will be saved regardless. So prepare to lose, Michiko. Michiko wields a spear and shield, which is weird compared to the other fights we have had where you fight the persona rather than themselves. During the fight, I thought it was interesting how Yuka reacted to Toro and DB. Instead of being callous and rude, as she was when Toro asked her out, she instead stood up to Toro, despite her distaste to dating him. She evolved, since Toro told her how she felt being rejected and despite not liking him, he was still human and deserved respect. I didn't really expect her to do that. After the fight, Michiko is in distraught. How did I lose to a pack of crude delinquents like you? She demanded, with her nose to the sky still in disbelief she lost to people who were ugly. Hidehiko finally had enough. Shut the hell up! Oh my god, you lost! Get it through your head! Holy, stop! Hork it like a seal and get it through your head and out of our sight! Holy sh... Jesus Christ, Hidehiko, chill, man! People like you always bully me. For what? What have I done? Well, it wasn't, wasn't nothing. This was entirely her fault. Rather than attempting to make friends and be overall nice people, she flexed her wealth and looks. Which, I'm gonna say it, she looks like an opera singer who didn't make it. There, I said it. I'm not, I'm not sorry. The issue is that she let her pride get to her. She adopted the idea that she's better than everyone else, and as a result, people resented her and refused to be around her. So, don't be like that. I feel like this is easy to avoid. Well... Even though we did the right thing, we don't have a complete mirror. And as a result, we can't beat the Snow Queen. Our quest is over. And as we walk around the school, we come to terms with our fate. Until DB approaches us. As a way to thank us, he gives us the remaining shards. Because we put our friends first over our goals. We can now save the school, all thanks to our friends. We confront the Snow Queen. Still frozen in the middle of the courtyard, it is time to finish this, once and for all. We wield the mirror and shatter the pillars, freeing the queen. It burns! Ah! Saiko is on the floor, with the mask floating in the air. A student appears in front of us. Before we can address who it is, our fourth boss fight starts. The boss is the mask, not the person that just appeared. Admittedly, the mask does look a bit goofy, and I understand why we're fighting the mask, but it was just a bit poorly paced. Oh well. After flawlessly beating the mask, all seems to be good. Miss Ayako gets up and mentions that her close friend, Tomomi's spirit, possessed the mask. She remembered her friend's last moments vividly. Saiko, congratulate Tomomi on getting the Snow Queen role. Tomomi thanks her and wishes that she was strong just like her friend. But you are a good friend, Saiko says. You won the role, fair and square. Days later, and Tomomi is speaking to another cast member. Saiko is lying to you, she mutters. She purposely performed poorly in the audition so you would get it. This is a fake achievement and everyone knows it. The seed of the curse has been planted. Tomomi became cold to her friend and she knew what she did. But Saiko genuinely tried to win the role. There was nothing she can do to convince her otherwise. It's all your fault! The mask won't come off! Tomi turns around, covering her face with a massive burn, fading to black. Maybe Saiko was being a bad friend by saying she was better. Or maybe because Saiko never really cared about Tomomi, he just acted like her best friend. That's kind of cold in its own right. Suddenly, a dark figure has appeared behind us. It's the queen herself, the Tomomi inside me. The human weakness is dead, and I am grateful. I am finally free. I will enshroud this world in black and white, void and sorrow, making the eternal night. Looks like we're not done yet. K has been keeping a random teleport active. Don't follow me, K. Like, ever. And off we go to put an end to this finally. The second floor of the school is a weird puzzle with one-way passages, which took me a bit too long to figure out. There are random rooms around which make you think you were going the right way, but just lead you to talking to random people on the second floor, which made the area more annoying to go through. The third floor doesn't really have much, although we can see students who didn't make it to the first floor. 
Same with the fourth floor. There's nothing really to note about it aside from it being boring. But when we get to the fifth floor, the color of the floors just slowly begin to thaw. Okay, here's where I gotta vent about the puzzle. From here, we gotta go to the eighth floor. Oh, that's easy. Just go up the stairs, I thought to myself. No, it's not. Some of the stairs go to nowhere, and it may take multiple levels for you to realize you aren't going anywhere. And then you're gonna go back down, and then you might even get lost and go up the same fucking route that you did earlier, and then get even more lost. Oh my god, I spent 30 to 40 minutes in total getting stuck here. After getting to the 8th floor, we meet the Night Queen. It would have been easier for the Eternal Night to fall. But I'll give you the despair you deserve. It splits into... Maki? And Kandori? Covering their faces with a mask. Why are you trying to protect this place? Kandori offers his assistance by guiding us to the ninth floor. Zeno will meet him on the eleventh floor. Starting the final fight with Queen Asura, also known as Nyx. Nyx is a personification of night. She is commonly seen in gowns that are starry and voidy design. Fun fact, Nyx also gave birth to the previous bosses we faced, Thanatos, Hypnos, and Nemesis, which works well in the game's story. The mask has created the fates and made them who they are now. The mask characters carrying her indicate two things. Her wish to destroy the school, which matches how Maki feels about the school. In another part, humors the party to allow us to succeed. We actually needed the masked man to help us, much like we need Kandora to help us with Maki, and even help us find ourselves. After the fight, the Queen disappears along with the masked assailants, and the school slowly begins to melt, returning the school to normal. We speak to Sayako in front of the entrance, astonished that we are leaving. We're going to help others who have been impacted by the Persona Ritual, which includes Maki and Masao. Which, hey, that's kind of cool. We're fulfilling ourselves the way that Simon Konjo had to do. We have fully righted our wrong. And now we're going to help others that need our help, which means we start the Seabeck route. This little detail allows both the Snow Queen and the Seabeck route to be canon. I really appreciate this. We actually don't get to know what happens to Yukina, Yuka, and Erika, but we do get to know what happens to Ryuji. With the vendetta being settled, he was finally free to live his own life. He married a kind woman reminiscent of his mother shortly after graduation, and now has a child of his own. With Hidehiko joking that the child inherited Ryuji's sharp tongue and standoffish personality. I... Didn't expect this to be so interesting. I thought this would be a silly one-off video where we beat the Snow Queen and go home within 20 minutes. But I found this to be much more interesting than the original route. And more importantly, it gave a clear theme. The dangers of isolating yourself. Every single character we fought against was alone. They may have been isolated as a result of rejection, the illusion of rejection, or their own egotistical mindset, or the fear of the good times ending. And admittedly, I can relate a lot to these characters. It's really easy to want to isolate. In fact, I'm going through this own motion right now. And that's okay. But what's also important to know is that the importance of reaching out to your friends. I cannot stress the importance of having good friends. Friends who will love you unconditionally, not for your materialistic goods, your skills, or anything else but people who like you because you are you. That's what's really important. While it is important to take time for yourself, it is equally as important to make time for your friends. The people who will love you unconditionally. I'll go. Your friends miss you.